I wanted to start off this episode talking about Harry Potter. That's why we're here, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's what we usually invite you here to talk about. I did want to say that after we had all of our Harry Potter episodes, I had a dream that uh, Gilderoy Lockhart was actually Harry Potter from the future who had time traveled <laughs> to the past and was wow. trying like not to mess up the time stream. And I was like, oh, if only I'd had that before. It would have made such a great theory. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I love this movie. Wait, I think so I could have proved it. <laughs> why did he come back to the past at all if his only goal is to not mess with no, the No, it was accidental. He doesn't want <laughs> oh, to no, be in the past. Gilderoy. Yeah, he's stuck in the past, and so he has to make a new identity for himself and becomes Gilderoy Lockhart. And he can't use any of his Harry Potter life stuff, so he has to steal life information from other witches and wizards. And make a profit while doing it. <laughs> well, yeah. Come on. Harry's <laughs> always reasonable. been rich. He doesn't know how to live if he's so not rich and a celebrity. <laughs> he didn't want to be a teacher at Hogwarts, but his he new identity <laughs> gained so much fame that he was offered the job by Dumbledore. And he thought not taking the job would cause more trouble than taking the job. Uh, so yes. this, this is a good theory because that's why he was telling Harry, fame's an ickle it's friend, true. Harry. He was yeah. giving Harry like good <laughs> advice right there. Yeah. He, he's he probably the best friend Harry's, Harry's ever side. had. <laughs> so, he, he was anyway. literally just telling Harry, don't be crazy because people won't like you. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all he was yep. telling him. <laughs> Did not sink in because right after Harry's like, yep. it's going to kill. It's going to kill. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Did you hear and that? if Gilderoy had lived through Harry's life, he knew Harry was about to say that. And he's like, don't. <laughs> Gilderoy Lockhart. It's too bad they obliviated him. He'll never know yeah, he was cool Harry. <laughs> no. What an inauspicious <laughs> end to the world's greatest horror. Hello and welcome to the Popcorn Isn't Real. I'm Leif Eric. I'm here with my co-host Torvald. And we're here with often recurring guest, uh, Brita. That's Hello. me. I'm Brita. No. Liar. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to give a special welcome to all of our new listeners. We have a lot of new listeners these days. So I want to say thanks for listening. You guys are great. And thanks for coming back, despite our best efforts to drive you away. <laughs> yeah, what did you get new listeners from? <laughs> Hubie Halloween, great, uh, of course. Oblivion <laughs> theory. Hubie Halloween is pulling people in. They love oh, it. They yeah. can't get enough of the sand livers. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, I heard you guys tortured yourselves by doing that. That's great. All right, Brita, why are you here today? What are we talking about? So we're here for our yearly tradition of recording an episode in November about a Disney movie. So this time we've chosen Atlantis. Atlantis, the Lost Empire. The main theory that comes to mind when you guys talk about Atlantis is the widely believed rumor that Atlantis was in fact plagiarized from a Japanese animation called Nadia Secret of Blue Water. So I, I went ahead and watched Nadia Secret of Blue Water and I watched Atlantis and I'm going to give my two cents on that. But Brito, were there any other theories that we'd like to go over today? Yeah, I actually asked to join you for this episode based on a theory that I had just watching the movie that I feel like is basically canon, which is that Preston Whitmore the person who funds this expedition for Milo comes off as just kind of a jolly eccentric older man who is just interested in, you know, helping out the grandson of his old friend, fulfilling a promise and maybe getting some information. He says he just needs one shred of proof. That'll be enough for me. He doesn't want anything out of this. Um, and my theory is <laughs> yeah, that, right. in fact, he is a capitalist uh, billionaire and well, he is looking true. to capitalize on this expedition as well that he okay. planned Rourke's betrayal he got this crew on purpose in order to do what Rourke is doing and perhaps he even betrayed Thaddeus in the past as well yeah okay so you're saying he sent them down there to raid and pillage and plunder Atlantis exactly like Rourke and Helga he didn't know there were people alive there he didn't necessarily think you were gonna have to just murder an entire living civilization well but then why did he send them down with so many guns I think that he knew that there was a civilization down there, and I think he planned to murder them. Maybe he planned to mur murder them. But regardless, his goal is similar to other like 1920s archaeologists like Heinrich Schleiman, who discovered the city of Troy. <laughs> they just want to find these treasures and then like sell them to museums and get rich and get famous. That's his goal. And then I also read somewhere that possibly his wealth was based on technologies. And if that's that true, he sense. may have also wanted to use some of the Atlantean technologies, use the crystal and uh, promote his business. I kind of feel like he doesn't need it. He's got some crazy steampunk tech. <laughs> <laughs> Leif, did you have any other theories about Atlantis or was that it? 
I, I'm going to argue in favor of what Valkyrie proposed. I believe that Whitmore murdered Thaddeus Thatch and got him out of the way. So you think Whitmore is far more sinister than Brita does. Brita thinks he's just like an opportunist. He's taking advantage of this opportunity to plunder a dead civilization. You think that he's a murderer, that he goes yes. around killing anyone who gets oh, in his way. Absolutely. Whitmore is bad news. Preston B. Whitmore, you want to stay away from that guy. All right, all right. Last theory we're not going to even get into. I believe Helga Sinclair might be Santa Claus. Yeah. Oh, what? <laughs> That's that amazing. Is the popcorn isn't real theory. That, that, <laughs> now this I can get into. <laughs> oh, boy. I mean, she did come down a chimney. Well, 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 well. <laughs> Sorry, did I just blow your entire evidence? <laughs> my evidence. Yeah, All you're my evidence, of Torvald. It. All of it's gone. <laughs> Before we get started, what are your guys' thoughts on Atlantis? Is it a good movie? Is it a is it a memorable movie in the Disney library? I think it's a really good movie. Uh, obviously, it came out when I was a child, so it's kind of an integral part of my childhood that I grew up watching this movie. Uh, I think it has some really good animation and beautiful character and uh, location designs. All that being said, I would say the story I don't think is anything special and is a bit white savior complexy yeah. for my no, taste. I, I felt exactly <laughs> the same rewatching it. The story is kind of flat and kind of like weird white colonist stuff, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway. yeah. yeah, this movie starts with Milo practicing his pitch that he's going to say to the department heads or whatever of this museum so he can get funding to go to Iceland. He presents some runes that he says are badly translated. So it says the coast of Ireland. I don't know where they got the letter R from because the letter C in Iceland is the same as the first rune in coast. And they got mm -hmm. it right on coast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it also doesn't make sense because if it's runic, it yeah. would have been a K, which means it wouldn't make the S sound in Iceland. Right. <laughs> I could. And I don't like they wouldn't have spelled coast coast. It wouldn't have been spelled no. in English just with runes. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> his runes don't make there. any sense. <laughs> the Nordic words for coast are similar, right? They're like I mean, coast or Kist. It coast in in like most Nordic languages is like kust. The spelling might have been similar in runic. Yeah, maybe sure. unless it's strand, which wouldn't have been anything like Iceland. <laughs> but. Yeah. Then he gets the map all over his shirt and he turns around to like try to yeah, be part of the map. Yeah, the map is somehow mirrored on his shirt when he yeah, turns yeah, around. It, should, it is. It it's be crazy. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> He's got like magic map shirt magic. It's weird. He's a cartographer. <laughs> I want that he shirt. Did it. Wow, you're right. <laughs> so Milo does not get the funding he wants, but he comes home and there's this Santa Claus. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's this jolly old man sitting in his <laughs> house. Oh, yeah. His belly's wiggling. No, like yeah, like bowl full of jelly. Got a red nose. <laughs> he's got a bag of gifts. And he's also, like, this is all happening oh, on oh, December 24th. I came down the chimney. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so well, Helga Sinclair is sitting in his Milo. house. <laughs> she, she, she actually looks like a femme fatale, which is interesting because that look would not come about until like the 1940s or no, 1950s. No, she started the look. She's yeah, the trendsetter. they're and basing it on her. And this happens in 1914. <laughs> yep. um, he asks how she got in. She says, I came down the chimney. Ho, ho, ho. Just what? the very first evidence of... You just blew of, my mind. <laughs> the very first evidence of a whole two pieces of evidence that prove that she could be Santa Claus. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's good evidence. Amazing. I mean, part of our podcast is that we generally take everything everyone says as 100% <laughs> literal and true yeah. as well. Not well, just literal, well, but also that, true. Well, <laughs> let's look at the type of person Helga is. So, it, first of all, we know that she can kind of switch roles. She can kind of change on a dime. She's like this kind of sexy femme fatale at the beginning, dressed in a black dress. Later on, she's just this no-nonsense total soldier, right? She's, mm -hmm. She doesn't really act like that, you know, random femme fatale who's in your house who's like, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho. You know, she's Everything like barking orders and stuff. very Santa Claus. Yeah, I know Santa for his <laughs> ability to no. be either a femme fatale no, or, no, or a, a soldier, yes. <laughs> Neither one of these necessarily proves that she is like Santa in any way, but it proves that she 
could be, and also that she is no nonsense. She doesn't lie. If she says, I came down the chimney, ho, 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 it is true. Yeah. Okay, so she's be on the <laughs> oh, nice list. I just realized what your second piece of evidence is going to be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, I hope, I hope it is what you think it is. <laughs> I, I bet it is. <laughs> This appearance of Helga Sinclair is also the first piece of evidence for Preston Whitmore as a villain that he chooses for our very first introduction to him, to his enterprise, to his idea to, to break have the law. this. Yeah, not only to break the law, yeah, but just this most like villainous seeming intro for this femme fatale, right? That she has mm -hmm. broken into Milo's house. His cat's missing. Yeah, <laughs> um, he stole the cat. He cat stole all Milo's stuff too. He packed it all. <laughs> His lights aren't working. He tries to turn them on. They don't yeah. work. And there so is... She cut the yeah. power. <laughs> she cut the power because to his she house. she thought he had a security system. <laughs> so she cut the power. She and wouldn't then, have in 1914. His security yeah. system was his cat, which she took out. <laughs> Which she yeah. took because it was a security system. Um, and then finally, you've got the lightning flashing behind her. So this is not only Whitmore, it's but also sinister. the people who made the movie. Yeah, making her intentionally sinister because she's the introduction, the first introduction we have to no, the I, movie's villain. I just have to point out that she is a villain of the movie. Whether or not yes. Whitmore yes. is, she is. <laughs> so <laughs> When she then leads milo to whitmore she gives him this long list of strict things he needs to do they says mr whitmore does not like to be kept waiting you will dress him as mr whitmore or sir you will stand unless you ask to be seated keep your sentences short and to the point are we clear and then she says he doesn't buy often <laughs> and then sends him in to meet mr whitmore and all these things seem really scary and then he meets mr whitmore and it's like oh it was all a misunderstanding he's, he's this quirky old man oddball. who likes to do yoga yeah and he'd be crazy but in reality if you watch the scene milo actually follows all those instructions he always addresses him as sir he generally speaks pretty short and to the point and then he doesn't i don't think sit down at all <laughs> he <laughs> um, definitely doesn't get bit often he doesn't get bit often either. Um, and so I think that she was being entirely genuine when she was giving this list of things that Whitmore demands. And if he had come in and been like, yo, Preston, Whitmore would have just like killed him. him a new one. <laughs> just pulled out a gun and shot him. <laughs> yeah. He's like, hey, let me sit down. Hey, I just got to tell you my life story. That's really long sentences. <laughs> Here's my first evidence for Whitmore may have murdered Thaddeus Thatch, the grandfather of Milo Thatch. Now, this is just sort of to establish the relationship they had. Whitmore says, I met old Thaddeus back in Georgetown, class of 66, tried to drag me along on some of his dang fool expeditions. Crazy oh. as a fruit bat he was. He hates well, he guy. has nothing good to say about Thaddeus <laughs> Thatch. I don't, mm -hmm. like, he says a few things like, I'm going with a clear conscience, you know, et cetera. Yeah. But, like, he never says a single nice thing about Thaddeus Yeah, it's Thatch. like he holds a grudge against him. And then Milo's like, funny, he never mentioned you. Whitmore says, oh, he wouldn't. He knew I much liked my privacy. I keep a low profile. As a criminal would. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I just have to point out why on earth is Milo so certain that this is the real Shepherd's Journal that Whitmore gives him? Because he would have known if it was a fake. His grandfather would right. have known he if says, it was a fake. I know this is true because my grandfather believed in it. He doesn't know that Whitmore even knew his grandfather. Like, this is just <laughs> some strange old man showing him pictures and giving him a book. It, it probably is fake. He's probably yeah. just pretending that he knows your grandpa. <laughs> He's like, oh, I believe everything you say. So when Milo says, I'll do it no matter what, Whitmore gets such an evil look on his face and yes, sinisterly says, congratulations, mm. Milo. And that's not me reading into it like we sometimes do and make them sound more sinister. Like he actually sounds sinister when he says that. That is exactly what I wanted to hear. I did also want to mention here, this was our sister Valkyrie's one point of evidence that Whitmore killed Thaddeus Thatch, was that she noticed that the picture of the On two the of picture, them over the like mantle. he's like covered in blood with a knife in his he's back? He's just covered in blood. And like <laughs> oh it says, it has a speech bubble next to Preston that says, I <laughs> murdered you. And then his grandpa has a speech bubble that's like, why did you kill me? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good How evidence. How did I never no. <laughs> notice that? 
<laughs> no, what she actually noticed was that there's a picture of the two of them hanging over the mantle. And Thaddeus looks the same as he did in Milo's picture of Thaddeus. And Mr. Whitmore looks the same as yeah, he does right. right now. It was like this year. Yeah. <laughs> she seemed to think that indicated he had died recently. And also that yes. Whitmore was, you know, around recently in his life, despite the fact that Milo, as we mentioned, doesn't know about him because Mr. Whitmore likes his privacy. People act like Thaddeus Thatch died a while ago, but he most certainly did not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and also, Whitmore has tons of artifacts in his house from tribal yes, cultures all over the world. Yes, artifacts. Say, he yeah. pilfers natives. That's what mm-hmm. he does. What He's he does. a tomb raider. <laughs> Definitely. And they're establishing this like on purpose. I think that's the intent of this scene. Yes, it is. At the time, a normal thing for wealthy men to do was to have a cabinet of curiosity, which is just kind of like your in-home museum that has all kinds of stuff from native peoples and from ancient peoples Wait, and things like people that. people don't do that anymore? I have to clean out my cabinet of curiosity. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, man. Get rid of that. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> It shows that he has something of a disregard for the people or the places that he's getting things from. What really supports your theory the most is that Whitmore not only funded this entire expedition, he wasn't just the money bags behind it. He organized it. He he was he was the planner. And he yes. shows Milo like his little miniature models of everything yeah. that he has included in the expedition. He, he made the and tanks. It's all he the made war the machines. <laughs> yeah, there's the balloon, there's the tanks, there's you know, I'm sure there's little figures with guns in those yes. tanks as well. <laughs> So that was going to be my next piece of evidence, is that even though he ropes Milo into this, very clearly he was ready to do this expedition. Like he had models of everything. He surely had all the stuff getting created or already created. And he had a crew ready. And then he decides to kidnap Milo and ask him to come along. It feels very much like he was planning this expedition without Milo, right? He didn't want to get involved with Milo or Thaddeus anymore, who perhaps he killed because Thaddeus didn't want to do things this way. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then he realized we can't do this without someone to read this journal. And so he decided to kind of strong arm Milo into it by not really giving him a choice, right? Like when he tells him, yeah, all no, this, he's not giving him a choice. At all. I'm starting yeah. to see this entire situation in a completely different light. This whole thing was a, a huge threat to like Milo's life. Like, yes. that's the reason that he kidnapped him and stole his cat and like took him into an ominous room. He's saying, if you don't do this, you're dead meat. <laughs> he's yeah. like, I'm well, no, nice he's when you do to what come I want. Off friendly, but yeah. if Milo had tried to refuse, then yes, he would have been like, no, we're not letting you well, go. Well, he's already showed, <laughs> shown that he has the capabilities to make Milo's life, you know, not good. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. like, Wait, I resigned Milo's for you. For him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What he's really saying is, I've got my eyes on you. Like, I'm surveilling you. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) See, that's what I thought was the more sinister part of that, is that he knew exactly what Milo had been up to that day, right? Milo even says, how did you know? And then never mind. (laughs) He just has this complete control of the situation. He's very limited in what he tells Milo, right? Like, all he tells them is, we got the journal, here it is. He doesn't tell them anything else about, like, how they got the journal, about what happened on that trip, about why they haven't done this expedition sooner. So this is good evidence for him murdering Thaddeus Thatch, as you were saying. You know, Mm -hmm. he's clearly already been practicing. He has two coelacanths in an aquarium, so he's been going down, practicing going deep sea. And also worth noting, this is before coelacanths had been registered straight as a species. No one knew about them. Wouldn't he have to keep them in like an incredibly pressurized tank or they would become like blobfish and explode? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, clearly he had been practicing with Thaddeus. At some point recently, Thaddeus had a change of heart. He said, your grandfather gave this to me years ago, referring to the journal, which could mean two years ago. It's just <laughs> plural years, <laughs> right? So Some they've been that. practicing. He killed Thaddeus recently, probably two years ago about. And then he orchestrated this whole thing. He knows that Milo didn't get the funding at the museum today because he's probably the one who called and told them to move up the meeting to 3.30 mm-hmm. so that Milo would definitely be willing to accept Mr. Whitmore's funding. I think that's probably true. And although there's no evidence for this, I think it's most likely that uh, the expedition to get the Shepherd's Journal was about two years ago. And it was either during or immediately following that expedition that they decided Thaddeus was more of a liability than a support. And so they got rid of him so that he wouldn't get in the (laughs) way of them continuing to pillage and steal whatever they wanted. So Whitmore is talking about Thaddeus Thatch. He says, finally, I got fed up and I made a bet with the old coot. I said, Thatch, if you ever find that so-called journal, I'll not only finance that expedition, but I'll kiss you full on the mouth. 
So he kissed Thatch full on the mouth, apparently, and hired a photographer to take a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, take a picture of that moment. Because <laughs> it was very hard to do photographs back in that day. <laughs> they had to hold that pose after, you know, that disgusting pose for like And also you keep know, like spitting because there was. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they, they drew that in after. He like had someone ah, yes, Photoshop yeah. it by hand. <laughs> so he acts like he was only going to finance the expedition to look for Atlantis after Thaddeus Thatch found the journal. Yes. But he must have also financed the expedition to get the journal in the first place because (laughs) his entire crew of mercenaries was on that expedition Mm -hmm. and they don't work for Thaddeus Thatch. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I agree. And I think that the crew is something we'll need to talk about in detail as well. Um, That when he introduces this crew, he says they're the best of the best, the same crew that brought the journal back. And he splays out their pictures. And both from like, what we see right here there and from what we find out later these aren't who you might expect to be the best of the best joshua sweet is among the most normal of them right he is a former military doctor and then you've got the demolitions expert Vinny. we never get any information about where he worked or what he's been doing previously aside from the fact that he worked in a flower shop and then got exploded and found his calling and has been and went to jail since yeah and went to jail I mean, and so that's the next thing we know that happened in his life <laughs> yes he, they i mean whitmore says he busted him I'm out, out of, prison, of a turkish which is prison not a legal thing to do <laughs> and he's not ashamed of that he's like yeah we busted him out of a turkish prison, turkish prison. i do he's prison the breaks. best Just this entire crew, they all seem like kind of shady individuals, not who you'd expect to be the best of the best, but who you might expect to be a crew of hired mercenaries who would do anything for money. And when Milo talks to them later, that turns out to be true, right? Like he asks them about why they're all here. Money. And that's interesting, too, because if you're funding an expedition to Atlantis, I don't think it would be very hard to get people who are there for reasons other than the money, right? Like, this yeah. is something that that Milo feels so strongly about, right? Like, he'd do it for free. He probably is. I don't he think is. he talked to Whitmore about payment. I don't think he's payment. getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, like, I think you could find other researchers who are like, yeah, I want to find out about Atlantis. Like, I want to be a part of this cool discovery. <laughs> and as shown later in the movie... He chose people who care about money because it's easier to get them to do horrible things. Uh, One little note is that he looks up at the picture of Thaddeus Thatch and he says, I know your grandfather's gone, Milo. God rest his soul. But Preston Whitmore is a man who keeps his word. You hear that, Thatch? I'm going to the afterlife with a clear conscience by thunder. I believe that the line about going to the afterlife with a clear conscience has to do with the underlying twinge of guilt he feels about murdering his friend Thaddeus Thatch. He's saying, see you in hell. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I promised him I would fund the expedition. I didn't promise I wouldn't kill him. (laughs) What a a man of values. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. If anything, I'd say the clear conscience comes from involving Milo, that he's like, look, I got your grandson. He's going to be thrilled to do this. See, it's fine. He wanted fine. to be like you. Yeah. <laughs> also, I am literally going to murder him. That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he intended to murder no, Milo. Oh, yes, he did. <laughs> no, I didn't promise not to kill a lot of people who I have. After killed. he talks about clearing <laughs> his conscience, he suddenly gets really sad and yep. just like filled with regret. And he says, he died a broken man, Thaddeus Thatch. <laughs> This is likely because Whoa, Whitmore had some him in thugs half. break him. <laughs> okay. I mean, he says it's because of the people laughing him out of, you know, academia, but sure. Well, that, well, that, that was too, but him. then he had some thugs show up and rough him <laughs> and up. And just break him. Why would he have been laughed out of academia? He found the Shepherd's Journal. Yeah. There's no reason that he would have been laughed out unless someone like paid off everyone to to shun this man, to blackball him. And who has enough money and motivation to do that? I don't know, Mr. Whitmore, who wants the uh, Shepherd's Journal and needs to get it from Thaddeus Thatch and wants to find a mission to plunder Atlantis. Your grandfather gave this to me years ago and told me to give it to you when you were ready, you whatever were ready. that means. Yeah, what, <laughs> I think why he just took just it after it killing him. <laughs> and I think that that helps to confirm the thought that perhaps he killed Thaddeus like during or immediately following the Iceland expedition. Because if you think about it, like not only has Milo never heard about his grandpa going to Iceland, like perhaps he heard about the theory from his grandpa and that's why he's pushing it so hard. But he never heard that his grandpa went there. He never heard that his grandpa found the Shepherd's Journal. And he's never heard about 
any of these other associates who all have, aside from Whitmer, they all actually have pretty nice things to say about Thaddeus. They act as though they were his friends. Um, and Whitmer says, oh, well, he wouldn't have talked about me. I like my privacy. But he, he doesn't give any reason that Thaddeus would have never mentioned any of the rest of this to his grandson, who also is obsessed with archaeology and linguistics and uh, Atlantis. Like, it doesn't make any sense that Milo would know nothing about any of this. In the the photo we see of the entire crew with Thaddeus with them, again, they're all the same age. And the only difference is that Audrey isn't there. Her is father there. is there. Yep. And, you know, she, obviously she would have been a couple years younger, so that makes sense. But, like, it means that this was happening recently and... Mm -hmm. Thaddeus never mentioned it to his grandson why he was leaving for long periods of time on expeditions. <laughs> and probably well, because he knew he was working he with shady him. mercenaries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think if we're done with that scene, the next scene is the launch of the ship, which I did want to mention briefly. Yes. Uh -oh. Um, <laughs> uh oh. Did something sinister happen while the ship was launching? So this is the scene where we get introduced to Rourke, who plays kind of the main role as the villain. He's the commander of the expedition and a big kind of military man. Milo makes a comment about how they're going to learn so much and, and just like bring these discoveries to the world because of this voyage. And Rourke kind of looks out at the boat and says, yes, this should be enriching for all of us. And it's him, Milo and Whitmore standing there. And it felt very much like kind of a comment that you'd make knowing that Milo wouldn't get it, but someone else would. And I yeah. think that someone else is Whitmore. We're getting rich, yes. Well, look <laughs> oh, at clearly. but look at Whitmore's face. Right after he says this should be enriching for all of us, Whitmore looks around, kind of shifty-eyed, between Rourke and Milo, and then bids them farewell. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Rourke said he didn't really like the Shepherd's Journal. He says, I prefer a good Western, which is mm -hmm. foreshadowing that he likes coming in and killing natives. <laughs> that's, yes. his, that's kind of his, uh, his thing. Torval, tell us about Joshua Sweet. <laughs> Uh, he hates Milo's. He hates the taste, hates the smell, <laughs> hates all those nasty little bones. <laughs> this should be able to saw through a Milo in less than 60 seconds. I'm betting I can cut that Milo in half. <laughs> With what? what? <laughs> the, 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 the thing he just showed you, Milo. <laughs> You're not paying attention. When Valkyrie and I watched it, I made her pause the movie and we watched Torvald's delightful edits <laughs> over wow, all the right so moments. Good. The next scene is Milo giving a presentation. Helga, for some reason, has her gun out during Milo's presentation, <laughs> yeah, perhaps ready to shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> we learn that Milo brings his cat to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> When the Leviathan shows up, I've always loved how good Helga is at translating Rourke's absolute yeah. gibberish yeah, into something useful. <laughs> he says, tell Cookie to melt the butter and break out the bibs. I want this lobster served up on a silver platter. <laughs> and, and Helga's like, well, the torpedo base, no sub pod crew, battle station. <laughs> There's no yeah. reason that he didn't just say those orders. He didn't need to <laughs> tell her gibberish and have her translate it. <laughs> and he literally does not want her to tell anything to Cookie. <laughs> No. <laughs> no. Even though she's a villain, I always loved Helga. She's a very strong female yes. character oh. that is, I think, amazingly she's like written. Best I love her. In the movie. Among Atlantis's dedicated fan base, Helga is actually one of the most cult classic beloved characters. No, good reason. Um, people she's just awesome. love her. She's a badass. Yeah, people love her yep. no no nonsense no kind nonsense. of badass. And you could say she's an antagonist. You could also say she's a protagonist because she kills she Rourke kills at the Rourke. end. Yeah. <laughs> she saves the day. It's not Milo. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's nothing personal. This might be a good time to first talk about the weapons because this is the first time we actually see them have weapons. And not just any weapons. They're loaded to the brim with weapons. When they pop out those subs, they're just like spouting missiles off like a freaking sprinkler. Later, the only explanation we ever get for all these weapons is Rourke talking to the king says they help us to remove certain obstacles we may find in our way. What obstacles did they think they were going to run into in an underwater submarine that they could just torpedo out of their way? Especially when Milo had the, the journal that shows you can just go through this tunnel. You don't need to get anything out of your way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we were saying, the, the crew members are purposefully depicted as being crass and uncaring toward <laughs> each other. Even Audrey, who is like 
a teenager. She's young. Yeah. She has no problem murdering her engineering crew. Like they're yeah. saying, wait, wait. And she closes and the she door closes on them. The she door. could have waited yeah, a she's... second. It's not going <laughs> to flood the whole ship immediately, which also the whole ship immediately floods right after that. And yeah. she yeah, with, so it did not gets help. onto the escape pod. She could have just let them through. She could have just let them on. <laughs> <laughs> so it's showing us that even Audrey, who seems, you know, one of the nicer ones is, is pretty no, she mean. Seem nice. She's, and also she's like Rourke later on people. is like, all right, who's not dead? Sound yeah. off. Like he doesn't care. Yeah. No, not at all. True. <laughs> so the one transport sub that escapes has all of their vehicles, including has everything. their balloon, which is great. <laughs> that had so much stuff on it. <laughs> oh, holy really crap. Useful sub. <laughs> what but, was the giant sub for? Because apparently they had everything on this small sub. <laughs> yeah. The giant sub well, wouldn't have even fit through the tunnel. The grease no, trap. it must mean that like, all of their small subs had all of those vehicles. Like yeah. they were coming oh. They had Way redundancy inside of redundancy. <laughs> Whitmore planned for every occasion. He, he knew that they were going to face trouble. But yeah, so the one with everything escapes, manages to get through the grease trap and land. And then afterwards we get the one and only scene in the entire movie where they mourn the dead. Now, I am assuming that in that shot where they're mourning the dead, that everyone is there. Is everyone. Because who yeah. wouldn't be there, right? That because they're, be they're paying respect. So five expendable crew survived. They later die when the bridge collapses. And by expendable crew, you mean like faceless men with gas masks? Well, no, 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 no. The expendable crew do not have masks. They have okay, mustaches. Those are just the okay. random dudes. Yeah. Okay. Along with, I counted at least 13 of mm -hmm. Rourke's Squad B, which is his elite yeah. squadron that wears gas masks. Those are the gas okay. mask people. I'm not sure why they wear gas masks all yeah, the time. They gotta keep their identity <laughs> secret. They're doing some bad stuff. Along with Audrey Sweet, Milo Rourke, Mole Vinny, Helga Packard Cookie. That makes nine more. So there were about 27 survivors. They started with 200. 173 people just died. Mm -hmm. And Rourke says, we've been up this particular creek before. So my question is, how many people did they lose in Iceland? <laughs> right. What could have possibly happened to make it <laughs> yeah. complicated? to losing 173 people to a massive <laughs> robot lobster. Well, wa watching it again at this scene, I was like, they should really call off the entire expedition because there's like 10% of them left. This is an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> Not that we necessarily need more evidence for these mercenaries being bad people, but... So we know that Vinny tricks Milo saying, oh, you drink oh, nitroglycerin, no. nitroglycerin, don't yeah, move. Best, best <laughs> and then prank I've ever seen. Mole says, boo. boom. And it turns out that prank must have been even better than we thought. Because we know Vinny packed nitroglycerin. He told Milo that at the beginning. Later on, when they get to the roadblock, he says, I wish could on roadblock that. Wish we had some nitroglycerin. Which means he doesn't have it anymore. Which means he <laughs> must have actually given it to yeah, he, Milo. <laughs> or he was so dedicated to the prank that he dumped it somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah, so that <laughs> so that Milo, if Milo he looked might for notice. it, wouldn't find it. <laughs> but the prank paid off instantly. <laughs> <laughs> he also could have left it on the sub. Maybe he didn't yeah. get all of his explosives. Yeah, okay, yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, pretty good prank. <sighs> so yeah, then we get the one humanizing scene where they finally all make camp together and kind of talk about their past. It's kind of the the one bonding scene between the crew. I really, really love how Mole gets so excited and comments on the Arrowhead story. <laughs> I think that that was a really nice touch because no one like Milo thinks it was touching because he found an Arrowhead and his grandpa got real excited about it. But then later he found out it was just compressed shale. And then yes. no one else thinks this is interesting. But Mole walks by and he's like, that's so cute. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's <laughs> I thought he was talking about his teddy bear. No, he's talking about the story no, because he, he loves he minerals. He He's like, yeah, that's no, that a really makes cute sense. Story. Only a dumb little kid would confuse compressed jail for an arrowhead. That's, <laughs> that's so cute. something that's, that is uh, really hammered down on in the sequel that Mole really yeah. loves. I know, and dirt. Dude. He's like I mean, freaking detective. He's like Sherlock the, Holmes. The sequel. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is called Atlantis Milo's Return, should have Return, really been yep. called Atlantis Mole's Return because he was <laughs> definitely the main character of the oh, sequel. Good. <laughs> he did everything in that movie. Yeah, he's that's, a freaking hero. That's funny because I, I didn't have time to watch the sequel, but I have read an entire plot synopsis that goes through it like point by point. And Mole is never mentioned. He, he <laughs> was the hero. They he don't act like he's important, but he literally does all the things. Yeah. He saves no, everyone's only... life in that movie several times. <laughs> Another thing about this scene is that I believe that Milo only makes friends with Audrey. I don't think even any of the others, even Sweet, likes him, even yeah, by the end of well, the movie. None of them support Sweet. him, only Audrey yeah. at the end. <laughs> yeah, Sweet, as we know, helps Audrey up the cliff earlier, yeah. but does not help Milo, even though he's Sweet is perfectly friendly, but he just doesn't care about Milo. So we know from this scene with the backstories that Audrey has not been with them on a mission before. Milo asks about Mole's backstory, and then Sweet says, You don't want to know. Trust I me. Also Audrey, you shouldn't have told me, but you did. <laughs> and I'm did. telling you, you don't want to know. How did Audrey know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why would she know his backstory better than My everyone else who's is actually that traveled? She joined with him? the group recently and therefore was curious and asking about and backstories. Asked, well. So she learned <laughs> yeah. it. And Sweet, who is nice but doesn't care about people, never asked. <laughs> I think that Torvald's right. But yeah, yeah I, I, I also so. thought that was weird. They find the Atlanteans. Milo is really excited that they speak all the languages, which doesn't which make doesn't any sense. Which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Not <laughs> even like, I love how they explain it away with the line, they must speak some sort of a root dialect. Yeah, and I'm sure. like, well, that means nothing. And then he adds, <laughs> like the Tower of Babel. <laughs> Another place unproven to exist. <laughs> So, but he's super excited. Helga says, someone's having a good time. Rourke says, like a kid at Christmas. Then Helga gets a strange look on her face, <laughs> yep. almost guilty. I think she's conflicted <laughs> between her mercenary occupation and her seasonal role as Santa Claus, which he reminded her of. She's like, oh, he no. is a kid at Christmas. We can't betray him. And also there are people living here. They're like kids wow. at Christmas too. <laughs> that is what I thought your second piece of evidence would be. <laughs> so, that's my second evidence. The last piece of evidence for Helga <laughs> is Santa Claus. That's she so reacts good. to the word Christmas with a look of guilt and betrayal. But what about when Milo <laughs> screamed, Jiminy Christmas, it's a machine. Why didn't they show her then? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> she was busy translating Rourke's orders at yeah, that point, true. which is a full-time job because it makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> So after she gets over her crisis of conscience with uh, Christmas, she then <laughs> says, Commander, there were not supposed to be people down here. This changes everything. And then he says, this changes nothing. And I like oh. that conversation because, first of all, it's the only time that they even reference the fact that, like, maybe we should be concerned about these people. No one mentions it ever again. And also, he's right. Doesn't change anything. They continue with their plan exactly as was. Right, which proves that it changed nothing, that this was Whitmore's plan. He hired them to do. <laughs> Rourke is not the mastermind here. He's just a military guy following orders. He's not some guy who's going to betray his employer. Then they get taken to meet the king who Torvald hates. Kita's dad is such a freaking hypocrite. Like. So she brings them in and he's like, hey, Kita, look, a bunch of people for us to kill. And then an instant later, he's like, whoa, hey, wait, you guys brought weapons? You monsters. To kill us? Yeah. <laughs> like, how dare he? This man, first of all, is a total warmonger who brought about the entire destruction of his empire with his warmongering, as we learn in the sequel. <laughs> Like, she says that he used his power to expand the borders of Atlantis, which caused the flood. All that this means is that he was conquering people. He was killing yeah. people. And just I mean, like... he says that himself. <laughs> and he has banned the use of technology and forbidden the teaching of reading and writing. Okay, <laughs> so... we don't know that. Here is what we know about the language. We know that prior to the flood, people could read and write. And after this big flood and the thing that happened in the, the sky and Atlantis got lost forever, no one can read and write. So Torvald is implying or suggesting that perhaps everyone in the entire community knew how to read and write, including the king. Uh, and then he banned the teaching. But even if that were true, we know that Atlanteans are very long lived. So even if you ban the teaching in the future, there would still be right, tons of people around who how, know how yes. to read. Exactly. 
And so what this means is not that they all just forgot how to read and write or even that he forbid the teaching of reading and writing. It means that when we see that scene at the very beginning where the kind of like stone monsters clap and then spread out their hands and it makes a barrier, it cuts people off, right? There are people mm -hmm. who are right on the so edge banging it cut on off it who want like to go the, in. The college district? <laughs> it, well, maybe. It cut off everyone who knew how to read and write. And that might sound really unrealistic. Like, but why would they keep all the people who know how to read and write in one area? Why didn't everyone know how? It's actually not that uncommon. There are different types of languages. A phonetic language like English, where you have uh, symbols that stand for each sound, is considered the easiest to learn. And so typically societies that have a phonetic language like uh, English, it's not a big status symbol to know how to read and write it. It's not something that's protected or kept from being other people learning it. Everyone is kind of expected to know it. Whereas you have other types of languages that are like more complicated that use signs for words. And those languages usually tend to have their writing systems be secretive. Only a small group of people is supposed to learn them. And so we would have to assume that this society has that kind of uh, reading or writing system, because obviously, otherwise, why doesn't everyone know how to read? But then you might say, well, the king surely would know how to read because he's an elite, right? Well, I would argue, no, that's not necessarily true because oftentimes kings want to delegate stuff. So it's just like you read me the list of stuff. And we have evidence of societies like that. For example, I'm doing my master's thesis on quipus, knotted cords, uh, which recorded information in the Inca empire. And the Inca kings could not read quipus. <laughs> that was uh, the job of a very specific set of people called the quipu kayumuks. And they were the only people in the entire empire who could read quipus. And they taught their sons, one son, and that was it. And it was passed patrilineally. Um, and so there was only a very small group of people in the entire empire that could read these specific types of kipus. Now, granted, there are other types. And so, for example, if all these people who were kipu kayamuks happened to live, you know, 10 blocks away from the king, and then there was a stone monster that put his hands up and blocked off the city five blocks away from the king, then everyone who knows how to read and write would now be dead. And so that's my theory for how the reading and writing system worked in Atlantis. Okay. So Rourke has the missing page. It must have been given to him by Whitmore because yeah, he doesn't Whitmore like the journal. The he prefers a good Western. <laughs> They seem to know something about what is on this page. It just has pictures of a crystal. That's not enough to tear it out. There's lots of random pictures in this book. Right. Mm -hmm. So I believe that this page was at least somewhat translated by right. Thaddeus. And that's when he exactly. turned against Whitmore because he was like, wait, there are probably people down there. This thing is their heart. It's the heart of Atlantis. We can't steal it. And then that's right. when Whitmore had to have Thaddeus killed. And he took that page. This is important evidence. Because there's only two people on Earth who can translate Atlantean, and that is Milo and Thaddeus Thatch. And Milo has never seen this page. And since they know what's on this page, then it must have been translated by Thaddeus Thatch. That's the only explanation. Rourke would argue, what's there to know? It's big, it's shiny, it's going to make us all rich. Well, yeah, because so, that's what yeah. Whitmore told him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I actually agree with you, though. I think this is pretty strong evidence because to our knowledge, even though Rourke was there when they dug up the journal, like we only have evidence of ever Thaddeus Thatch having it and Whitmore having it. Thatch certainly wouldn't have just let Rourke tear a page out of it and not no. notice, right? Like, Unless he <laughs> you was see how obsessed murdered. Milo is with this. I can't believe Thaddeus would be any less interested. And so clearly it was when the, the journal was in Whitmore's care that this page was stolen. And why would Whitmore have just given the journal to Rourke and not bothered right. to see what he was doing? Rourke, like he knew Rourke full well <laughs> that Rourke <laughs> took this, this page. And that was part of his deception of Milo. When Milo first pops his head up, he's not quite sure what's going on. He's like, hey, guys, what's going on? What's what's with all the guns? <laughs> and then he realizes, oh, I'm such an idiot. This is just yeah. another treasure hunt for you. And You're Mole after the crystal. makes the most evil face ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah oh, Mole's so evil. He's right. like, yes, killing time. <laughs> 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 yes. And so I did want to point out that everyone is there in this scene, right? So this indicates that... This was not just like a hidden thing that suddenly Rourke had this idea and was like, hey, let's go with this. This was known. The entire crew had been planning this except for Milo, right? And the person who set this all together is Whitmore. So it makes sense that he planned it. And then, of course, Rourke's answer to all this is that, you know, it was on a need to know basis. And well, uh, now, you know, had to be sure you were one of us. And so us indicates all of the crew and Whitmore. And he's thinking perhaps now Milo, except Milo then refuses to join them. 
So I wanted to point out that Helga, as evil as she may seem, does at least value human life. When Milo points out that taking the heart of Atlantis would kill all the Atlanteans, she says, knowing that, I would double the price. Yeah. And there's, there's no reason for her to say that other than that, well, if we're killing a lot of people, we Must might as well double it. the price because that doesn't make it worth more to anyone else. No, exactly. <laughs> you know? She's like, I, I don't want to do this, so I better get more money for it. Yeah. Well, right. Rourke says, I was thinking triple, so he values He well, really him cares too. about them. He's if like, he's going to compromise people. his morals, he might as well get a lot of money. Rourke doesn't have morals. <laughs> Finney says, we've done a lot of things we're not proud of, robbing graves, plundering tombs, double parking, but nobody ever got hurt. Well, maybe somebody got hurt, but nobody we knew. Um, so Except I would argue, we batch. already know that around like 170 people died when <laughs> yeah. the, well, when people the ship have definitely down. gotten and it, hurt. And yeah. it's happened before. <laughs> and it's happened before. And so I think Vinny, by nobody we knew, essentially just met the essential people. The, the no crew, main characters. The, you know their names. Yeah, no main but characters. Have Thaddeus Thatch was and the now main Thaddeus character. Thatch. He's in the picture. But I don't think that the entire crew was in on Thaddeus Thatch's death. I think Whitmore and maybe Rourke did that on their own. Yeah. So they don't know that he died from being murdered. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So this is where we learn that Audrey is Milo's only real friend. Everyone yep. else just stays because of Audrey and they're her friend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, Audrey has a lot of real friends. Milo does not. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> So the heart of Atlantis and any of the Atlantean crystals that presumably came from it have the ability to make you not age. And this, I believe, is why Whitmore wants it so bad. I think yeah. that, that was in the page that uh, Thaddeus translated for him. Oh, you think he's after the fountain of youth. When Milo meets him, Whitmore is clearly obsessed with extending his longevity. He is obsessively doing yoga. Which was not popular back in 1914. <laughs> exactly. And he's really good at it. He's like the most freaking uh, flexible man well, on he earth. He also so. thinks to think that yoga is Tai Chi sometimes. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. But either way, he's doing uh, it to try and keep himself young and spry. And he's very dedicated to it because nothing will interrupt him. And he clearly does it many times a day, every day, because he's so good at it. So I'm just saying he really wants to extend his longevity. And that's why he wants the heart of Atlantis or at least some Atlantean crystal. Um, and maybe he gets that in the end. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, also he had those coelacanths, and those are known for being very long lived. Yes, Whoa, they're called he, the living fossils. He too. envies them. <laughs> He's like, if only I was a coelacant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know which Atlantean ship he'd get if he came down to drive them. Well, um, I mean, but do they have something a little more sporty, like a tuna? Like Epona? So Whitmore also says to Milo at the beginning, he says, he just wants to bring back a shred of evidence, or perhaps he mispronounced a shard of evidence. A shard of evidence, you got it. <laughs> he just wants one little crystal. I did want to take just a moment to talk about Kita and the crystal, as we did a little bit at the beginning. Since I was a child, it's been baffling to me. According to the dad, in times of like distress, the crystal will take a member of the royal family to like power itself to deal yeah, with it. And we saw it, we saw it do that before with her mom. So it absorbs Kita. And then just turns into a crystallized Kita, which it and hasn't then has done before. And has her walk into a cage. <laughs> and then just walks into the box that Rourke has. Why? I think the crystal wanted out. It doesn't like being in Atlantis. <laughs> this is a stupid dying society. It's like, let me out. <laughs> Let's go. So the crew sided with Milo, at least the ones who stayed with him. But I don't think that means they would just go kill Rourke and Helga and Squad yeah. B. Who no, they they're, presumably they're knew. Like, yeah, like they couldn't have it. always been wearing their gas masks and never speaking, right? No, like no. they must Those have associated. From what I've seen, knew. yes, yes, they could have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, is there any evidence in Helga's death about her being Santa? Like, couldn't Santa have flown to safety? Not without his reindeer. Well, if she placed her finger on the side of her nose, <laughs> oh, then, then up, she could up the chimney, up chimney or the <laughs> volcano, she would rise, yeah. <laughs> which might be what happened. We never find out what happened to Helga. We don't see. <laughs> and also, as I said, she's popular among fans. So one of the most popular 
fan fics are always written about how Helga managed to survive the balloon crashing. <laughs> um, and but the subsequent she, volcano eruption? Volcano. Yeah. yeah she, you know, she just went up. She put a finger on the side of her nose. No. <laughs> ah, yes. So when she's talking to Rourke and she's mad at him, first of all, she's pretty cool for just like jumping back up and kicking him in the face. But yeah, yeah no, she's girl, very Helga. cool. She's like, you promised me a percentage. And Rourke says, next time, get it in writing. Get it in writing. But presumably she did have it in writing. She's a mercenary. She wouldn't go on this mission without a contract, right? Maybe what he specifically <laughs> meant, because he had just tried to kill her. So next time get it in writing that I won't kill you. Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. She's like, this I thought that Whitmore was a principle. given. <laughs> no, it was the same thing with Thaddeus that. He, ne- yep, he never promised right. he wouldn't kill him, so he could kill him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. That's Rourke how they work. Whitmore, two peas in a pod. <laughs> they really are. So then Rourke throws her off the balloon and yells after her nothing personal and then a few minutes later when she shoots him and ultimately leads to his death she nothing holds personal. up her gun and goes nothing personal but it um, is personal it's is a complete lie yeah, it's very personal <laughs> it is literally only personal <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> Do you know why Rourke turned into an evil crystal volcano man when he got cut that seems to just be a power of the crystal it turns you into a monster that can only go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty cool noise. <laughs> All I can say is that Rourke must have been expecting that to happen because nothing surprises him. It's true. <laughs> Audrey tells us. Well, he did keep fighting Milo, so he wasn't very surprised by it. I I think it has nothing to do with the Shard of Glass. I think Rourke could always do that. Whoa. <laughs> he just activated his power and became crystal right then. Oh my goodness. So just oh, like so he was happened like, well, he got cut gonna... by Milo and he was like, oh man, Milo actually got like, hit Milo on Milo has a me? weapon now, I better... so I better power up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. No way. He's like, I am not left handed. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. Rourke, you crazy Rourke is so much more man. powerful than I ever imagined. Rourke should just do that. He's like an X-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did we not explain? Did we not set that up? <laughs> He's like, oh, Milo scratched me. Better become crystal. <laughs> he just walks out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Rourke, you crazy crystal monster man. Milo should have never activated his secret power. Um, <laughs> actually, it didn't really help him much in the end, so. No, not really. <laughs> well, in the end, all of the evil mercenaries get to go home with, with piles exactly and piles of treasure. And yep. Whitmore then covers up the entire thing mm-hmm. like it was some kind of illegal activity. That was my last <laughs> piece of evidence from this movie is that as they're going over the cover up, right, he's asking. It's an alibi scene. <laughs> exactly. And that he's just so used to it, right? <laughs> like that planning a cover up was not only like something he's it's done before, nature. but it was an eventuality. Like he was planning for this. In fact, perhaps he had this cover up planned for someone else, maybe for Milo. And And it's not like he's not holding a solemn moment for the fallen people. He's like, so what's the story? What happened to those, you know, dumb people who died on the expo? Like he doesn't care about all these presumably friends (laughs) that he's worked with for years who are now dead. I have one crazy alternate theory that's very the popcorn isn't real esque. So the alibi scene Everything could be interpreted to be the oh, truth. I knew you were say they that. <laughs> they say that that Rourke went to pieces because of a nervous breakdown. They say Milo uh. went down with the sub, and they say that Helga is just missing. It could be that Milo died at the very beginning. He did go down with the sub. And since Milo was their entire plan, this caused uh-huh. Rourke to lose his mind due to a nervous breakdown, and he imagined that Milo was with them the whole time. Oh. Milo <laughs> Milo. So it's all from the Rourke's point of view. I get it. <laughs> but then everyone else just randomly found treasure somewhere and brought it home? No, so they're dressed up because Whitmore made good on his offer and paid them a lot. Oh. And what they found was rocks, sponges, and fish, just like Vinny says. And that's all. all right. <laughs> <laughs> and this whole amazing Atlantis adventure was Rourke just going crazy. I would just nice. like to ask, Leif, don't you ever get tired of that theory? You have that theory <laughs> no. all the time. Oh, the popcorn isn't real. That theory. Yeah. This, is, this is brand new. <laughs> but regardless of your interpretation, Whitmore saying, I'm going to miss that boy. At least he's in a better place now implies that either he thinks he went down with the sub or 
he believes that they did to him what he did to Thaddeus, that they killed him and just came back with all the treasure. (laughs) So you think that Milo packaged up a crystal and wrote a note to be given to Whitmore in the eventuality of his death? I think it's like it's like an alibi. That was like their suicide note that they made for oh. Milo. Oh, <laughs> wow. But, but why? They want it to look like he died on the sub, so why would they make a fake note that he sent to them from beyond the grave? Well, no. So maybe the, the mercenaries didn't know that Whitmore had planned all that. <laughs> like, we already put, put together already this, our own a suicide note so for Milo. He was just digging through their stuff and happened to find their stupid alibi. And he's like, well, this is dumb. <laughs> Also, he gets a crystal. He gets exactly what he wanted all along. Milo is so (laughs) stupid that he sent him a crystal. He also got access to Atlantis, which we see Mm -hmm. in the next movie. In the sequel. (laughs) Atlantis, too, is insane. I had never seen it before because I thought, like, it was probably the worst movie ever. And I gotta say, this movie starts out and it is the worst movie ever made. But then it quickly becomes a completely different movie yeah and then it becomes three different movies (laughs) it's so weird yeah so someone at disney realized that atlantis unlike most disney films did not have an annoying animal sidekick and they're like we need to fix that it needs one of those but this brings me to one thing i wanted to say about this movie is the weird mandela effect i had watching it because i had only seen the cover and for some reason my mind misremembered the cover and had made up a story where this was a movie about them saving the crew of the Atlantis a, like, some lava saving dogs. like a Nessie from happiness yeah, like a that's exactly <laughs> what I thought too it's Loch so weird. Ness I monster think that. I thought that's what it was about Me and then I, I was like that's I, so crazy that it never showed up in this anthology I assumed it was going to be one of the stories never yeah, happened never happened they never like, had to save any baby animals I so I looked I at the poster again story. and I had just miss seeing the poster i misremembered it and it's just the purple lava dog that is on their their boat with them and i thought yeah. it was way more important because it's on See the... now this this is the poster i remember but yeah i think in my mind that thing being on the boat made the movie about that thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i thought they were rescuing it from like yeah. hunters or something <laughs> yeah <me too. laughs> i don't know why my brain made up I, this I, dumb <laughs> i thought the exact same thing as you this is so weird that right. both of us made that up in our minds Mr. Whitmore ventures down into Atlantis this time. He's gotten a taste of the crystal and he wants more. And he even says so. He says that the crystal makes him feel 20 years younger, but not young enough. Very quickly at the beginning of this movie, Whitmore emphasizes it was yep. all Rourke's plan. He sure which does. Seems a he little goes suspicious. Out of his way <laughs> to pin everything on Rourke. He's like. <laughs> Your grandfather would be proud, Milo. You discovered a lost empire. You probably saved the world from Rourke's plans for the crystal. <laughs> what What did he think Rourke was planning? He just wanted to sell the thing. <laughs> he was going to give it to the Kaiser. <laughs> I think that this implies that Whitmore knows a lot more about Atlantean lore than he's letting on. Because it turns out that using that crystal and other Atlantean artifacts, you actually can bring about the end of the world, as we find out later in this movie. <laughs> Several cargo ships have gone down in the North Atlantic, according to Whitmore, and the survivors say it was a sea monster. Like, this is so strange, especially when you're expecting a movie about them saving it's a pink so dinosaur. It's so weird, dude. Like, it takes a hard <laughs> left turn. This is a, like, Lovecraftian Cthulhu mystery. It is. <laughs> like, it's like a detective <laughs> novel set in a Lovecraft universe. It's so weird. Mole is, like, the biggest yeah. gosh darn hero ever Freaking and saves hero. them at every turn. He tells them they're about to fall off a cliff. They fall off, and then he tunnels through the cliff to come out underneath them to catch them. You no, know, he saves them four times in a row. First the cliff, he saves yeah. them by putting hooks in the cliff. Then Audrey is falling, so he tunnels into the cliff and tunnels out yes. below her. And then he saves them when the Kraken takes control of Audrey. He blows he up does. the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And then when there are a bunch of hypnotized villagers attacking them, he takes out all the villagers yep. like he alone. He just takes out. them out. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty insane. <laughs> the second story of this movie is a Western and there's dust wolves attacking. So I'm going to try to prove that Whitmer set all of this up. We know that the Kraken probably originated from Atlantean technology and that it has been controlling that town in Norway, but not doing anything up until recently. Just recently, it started attacking ships, but only cargo ships. Whitmore instigated this. He said, hey, steal cargo and I will buy it from you. When they get to 
Middle America for the next section. This evil god with wolf dust powers, he murders a strange cowboy capitalist. This cowboy capitalist is the exact kind of person who would work with Whitmore. He likes to find ancient artifacts and resell them at, you know, possibly marked up prices, but always illegally. Then we get to the third story, which is that Whitmore supposedly had a break in that all happened while he was gone. And yet he knows exactly what happened and how it happened and who did it. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of weird. He says that <laughs> an ancient Norwegian spear was stolen off of his wall. It's not a Norwegian spear. It's an Atlantean spear. It was stolen by Odin himself. Oh, no. It's actually not Odin. It is an old business rival named Eric Hillstrom. I think Whitmore put him up to this. I think uh, Whitmore told him to take this spear. Eric Hellstrom is going to end the world with it until uh, Milo and Kida stop them. And all of this is so wrapped up in Whitmore's life that I can't help but think that he had something to do with it. And what do these events cause? Well, they cause Kida to use the spear to raise Atlantis, which would give him easy access to the crystal that he wants. He says, the world was never the same after that day. It was much, much better <laughs> for yeah. him. For me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was able to get the crystal that he wanted. There you go. The last theory. Nadia, secret of blue water. Exactly. So there's a big controversy that states that Disney plagiarized Nadia's secret of blue water. There was a bit of an uproar from fans, so much so that they actually pushed the company that made Nadia to sue Disney. The pressure was so high that the company actually like commented on it and they were like, yeah, we're, we're not going to do that. We don't want to get involved with Disney's lawyers. Never sue Disney. Yeah, no, that won't <laughs> the House well. of Mouse always wins. <laughs> right. <laughs> Basically, arguments say that there are too many similarities between the two for it to have just been a coincidence. Disney says that, no, 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 it was just based on Jules Verne and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea mythology. And since they were both based on that, then of course they were similar. Nadia Secret of Blue Water started as a Hayao Miyazaki's adaptation of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Most fans of the plagiarism theory state Jules Verne never, ever, ever said anything about magic crystal based technology being used by Atlanteans and that is central to both series. I uh, I went ahead and watched the entire show. Oh gosh, why? It's okay. It's <laughs> fine. It's just an anime. It's a bit it's got outdated. Team Rocket in it. <laughs> it's got Team Rocket in it. Let me tell you, the first evidence that I have for this is that Nadia, uh, Secret of Blue Water, does start out with basically the Viking prologue um, or the Atlantis Two opening. Um, yeah, it starts out with like sea monsters are attacking random ships. So oh, no. Yeah, I noticed <laughs> so, that too. I watched the first episode. <laughs> the main character Jean, he is an inventor. He absolutely does resemble Milo. He is excitable and blonde and wears glasses and is nerdy and loves science. The character designs are very similar. <laughs> they are. And he specifically wants to finance an expedition to look for his father, an explorer who went missing on a ship over a year ago during an Atlantic crossing. Also, Nadia, the other main character, she is a dark skinned beauty from Atlantis, a lost civilization that uses magical glowing crystal technology. Which she keeps around her neck. <laughs> she does, yes. She has shady military style agents hunting her constantly because they want the technology. Some of them are just Team Rocket. <laughs> Others are not Team Rocket. Okay, first I'm going to go through the differences with these two characters. So Jean, the boy, he's a French inventor who is a child, not a fully grown American linguist. Nadia, she's living in France, not in Atlantis, and she's performing in a circus as a lion tamer. She also does not know she's Atlantean. She has no idea where she was born and thinks she's from Africa. So, you know, they're not exactly the same. Evidence that the Team Rocket group in this, that Team Rocket plagiarized them, um, they definitely did. Yeah. <laughs> Team Rocket, sorry, being from Pokemon. So there's a group of bad guys in this that consists of a redheaded, commanding, dominating lady, a tall, suave, classy man, and a short, squat, slobby man with a Brooklyn accent in the dub. <laughs> um, they they are team rocket and they go around having team rocket-esque adventures the entire show so there yeah. you go they definitely pokemon ripped them off I, I i fully believe that even more than the atlantis ripped off uh, <laughs> yeah. nadia some other similarities so 
through crazy circumstances. The two main characters do end up on a boat full of military people on an expedition. They also end up on an insane experimental tech submarine, which is the Nautilus, captained by Captain Nemo himself, which does go to Atlantis. The second in command of the sub is a strong, dependable blonde woman named Electra. Is she Santa, though? No, she's not Santa. <laughs> Nadia does, at one point in the show, enter like a special Atlantean room with Jean to commune with a giant white whale using her crystal, which is very similar to the scene when Kida and Milo see the heart of Atlantis for the first time. Major spoilers for Nadia, by the way. Yeah. It is revealed near the end of the show that Nadia's dad caused the destruction of Atlantis oh, no. um, and is also Captain Nemo. Um, and oh. it was due to the warmongering ways of the leadership of the society. So this is very, very similar to Kida's dad and what he did. Nadia gets possessed by her crystal several times and enters a trance-like state and just stands there with her eyes glowing. Um, at one point on, uh, on an island, um, they, she gets possessed and sucked into like an Atlantean chamber, and then she makes energy blast up around the island, just like when the ancient king's heads blast up at the end of Atlantis. Major differences. I think Nadia versus the plot of Atlantis are entirely, completely different. Couldn't be further from yeah. each other. There are similar events, but the plots have nothing to do with each other. I don't think Disney specifically ripped it off as far as plot goes. Yeah. I do think Disney maybe was inspired by some of the characters and events in the show, but that's about it. Let's go over the theories. So, uh, Brita, you first. All right. So for my theory that uh, Mr. Whitmore was evil, I think that there's pretty good evidence to support it. I think that there's not really any evidence that he's a good person. <laughs> so I would yeah. say it's basically confirmed. I mean, I think the one thing you said that makes this a really good theory is just that everyone who comes away from this movie thinks that Whitmore is a good guy just because he acts fr friendly and eccentric. But if you think about it for just a minute, it's obvious he's he's not a good guy. <laughs> yeah. Frida, do you think Helga Sinclair was, in fact, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus? Uh, yeah, there were two really good pieces of evidence. I, I don't know if I could argue against them. But also, no, definitely not. She's not she's Santa, Santa Claus. Yeah, she's not Santa. <laughs> Having heard the similarities and differences between Atlantis and Nadia, Secret of Blue Water, do you guys think Disney ripped them off? They took some inspiration, I think. Uh, whether they deny it or not, someone had heard of Nadia's Secret of Blue Water. It's not as bad as, like, say, the Lion King similarities or especially the Aladdin and the Thief and the Cobbler stuff. Which, which we, we should, should go do an episode sometime. about. Yeah. yeah. We should. Well, thanks so much for listening. If you like our podcast, give us a review, a positive review even. And uh, music for this episode was provided by Christine. And remember... The, the popcorn, popcorn isn't, isn't real. real.